Hello and welcome. This is Direct Talk on Tigray Television. Today we're joined by Faven Taklaimanot, a psychotherapist and a lecturer at Marale University. Today in this edition, we're going to be talking about the sexual violence committed, perpetrated on Tigrayan women and girls. Thank you very much for joining us here on Direct Talk. Thank you. Uh, moving on to my first question. So you've been caring for around 300 uh, victims of sexual violence, and could you tell us a little bit about what these women have experienced, and also, what are some of the stories you've heard? Um, it's actually around 331, to be exact, the patients that have been treated. 80% um, of them, they survived uh, sexual violence uh, directly, that means, and 20% of them, their children's above the 100 percent that means I mean, we survive when you say physical children, violence can you tell, tell us the age range right there oh from my experience this yeah. is just all the things that i'm going to share today is just my experience based on 300 in 31 patients it doesn't really it's not a sample to show what happened in Tigray in general i want to i want to uh, uh, and i think the age range from my experience it's from 8 years old up, up to 75 years old uh, grandmother and the eight years old that I that I saw she didn't even survive um, she was raped on two days so the age range was from eight up to 75 and there are generally to be specific 331 survivors and not all were sexual violence survivors 80 percent of them were a woman children and girls who has been uh, who survived sexual violence and 20% of them were only children or any person who survived another kind of, another sort of, another form of violence. It could be physical violence, it could be torture or anything like that. Um, it's really difficult really to, to pick some stories and to share. I mean, all of, all of the stories, all of the patients that I was providing mental health and psychosocial support, they had unique future and characteristics that that, that, that makes me very difficult, I mean, very, very, um, it's very difficult for me to pick some stories since all of the stories are very horrific and very devastating. But if, if I have to share some, I would choose from any features, from any characteristics, one, one. And the first one is the gun grip. So from my own experience, the patients that I was providing, they were gun gripped, most of them, I would say 99% of my survivors that I was following, they, they survived a gun grip, which is from above two soldiers up to 16 soldiers. So I want to share this woman's experience who has been raped by 14 and the other one by 16. And it was, it was really horrific even to be there to witness this girl, this woman who experienced such a gun grip and listen to their stories. And the woman that I told you who survived a 16, a gun grip by 16 soldiers, all of them were Eritrean soldiers. And what they did were, th this is really hard even to share, what they really did were, they, 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 there was a rope and there were two trees. So they, um, I don't know how to describe that in English. Um, uh, they let her stand there in the trees with her hands tied to two trees. trees, yes, to two trees. They tied their her hands, two hands, her legs also, and then they let her stay the whole day in that tree, tying her hands in their her also foot. And then after that, they went to like uh, most of the day they spent it by robbing, looting, destructing the Trugans property in general. It could be individuals, could be the government also. So they tied her hand and her legs and they left. They were looting, distracting and everything. And they come back at night. And after they come, they were eating their dinner and everything. And after they finish, they untie her, all her hands and also her foot. And after they untie her, they raped her for 16, 16 soldiers. One alternately to the other. And after they raped her, they also untie her the whole night. So they, they tie her again back? Yes, they tie her back the whole night. 
And when she shared the story, she said that in the, in the next morning, that means when they wake, the leader of the, the, the 16 soldiers, they told the, the rest, that means the other 15 soldiers, to keep going with the property and everything they hold. And after, after they leave, he raped her again. She was begging him. I mean, when she, ser- when she shares the story, it was, it was even hard for me to listen, to be there and to, to share her pain. And she said he raped her again, alone. And after he did that, she said the moment he unties her hands and her legs, she, she describes it in a way, um, in a way that describes her physical pain at the moment in her womb that occurred in her womb. And uh, she said that when he untied her after the whole night, after she experienced a, a rape by 16 soldiers, and when he untied her in the morning to rape her again, she said her womb got out, in, 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 like, out, outside. I cannot forget all the stories, but I cannot forget this is specific story. So I cannot forget her. this is the her. witness from the victims. This is yes. straight from the horse's mouth. Yes, exactly. All of the things that I'm going to share with you, it's the stories that I hear from the patients, from the survivors, while I was providing a mental health and psychosocial support right in the moment during the war. In the, 60, in the six months when the war was occurring, starting from February up to June. So all the stories that I share with you today, it's not from say it's not from anything. It's from the, the, what I hear from the, the survivors by their own, story, by their own words. So it's, it's, a, it's a story that I, that I heard, that I even share, that I, I share the shock, I share their experiences. So all of the things that I share with you is uh, what they share with me by their own words. It is horrific. Yes. This is the story that I never forget. Very sad. I mean, moving on to my second question, you've, you've been, I mean, you've used, you've boldly used the terms like genocide of rape or ethnic rape uh, to describe the violence on Tigrayan and uh, women and girls um, in this conflict. So why have you chosen to use these terms? Like, for example, what in the stories that these women have shared with you has led you to believe, I mean, this is the case. Um, the, the reason that I use the word genocide or rape, it's because all the features and characteristics that I saw based on the testimonies, what the, the survivors were sharing with me, it can only be described as genocidal. It wasn't only sexual. You cannot say it was sexual violence per se. It was sexual violence, of course, but you cannot say that it was sexual violence per se. So the, it, it only can be described as genocide or rape. It wasn't also a wartime rape per se. So it can only be described as genocidal. Why? There are features and characteristics that fulfill that I boldly say genocidal because it fulfills the features and characteristics that the world agrees that this is genocide or rape. Um, but not, not recognized and no one is calling it by its name. But uh, yes. how could we say that? I mean, like, so far it has not been recognized, like you've said. These atrocities are, you know, perpetrated. Yeah. These heinous crimes here on the women and girls of Tigray. Mm-hmm. But the world has failed to recognize it as a genocide. Yes, that's true. So what um, went wrong with the world yeah. for, re- for failing to recognize this? As yes, I highly believe that just because someone else outside, you know, an international community, I don't know, any organization or anyone, just because they're not saying it genocidal, just because they're not calling the sexual violence that happened in Tigray, just because they're not saying it genocide or rape, just because all the atrocities that happened in Tigray is not being called genocide, it doesn't mean that the truth is not that. So it only shows that they fail again, not for the first time, for that matter. This is not the first time that they fail when a genocide and genocide are committed in some people. This is, I mean, it's, it, it could be in, in decades, it could be the third or the second failure that the international community shows. When in Rwanda, from 20, 250,000 up to 500,000 women have been raped and it was genocidal rape. And at the time being, no one called it genocide, no one called it genocide or rape. So what happened in Tigray, it's genocidal and no one is calling it, but it doesn't mean that it's not the truth. 
it means that it, they are they are failing again. It only shows that they are they are also doing another mistakes in the whole world. Um, I, I would like to say that. So when I say genocidal, people say some people in organizations also they say no one called the genocide and no one called the genocide a rape, and you cannot say that. But I know what happened in Tigray more than they did, more than they do. For for that matter, they are not doing anything right now. So it's our it's our responsibility to share the features and characteristics and to share the whole world, starting from the Ethiopians, the Africans, and the whole world that what happened in Tigray has a genocidal features and it can only be described as genocidal. I would like to say that. And for the, the for the other question that you raised, why they are still failing is the first thing I, I as a, as a psychotherapist I see things professionally. Uh, that's how I that's how I understand things and people in international community or anything in the whole world. So I think the reason that they are failing is that they are not observing, they are studying, they are not collecting any data, and I don't think they have the the exact uh, image of what happened in Tigray, in Tigran's women, Tigran's girls, in Tigran children. Um, that's why we have to speak about it. That's why the, the, the people, the experts, anyone who had experience with survivors, with not only genocide Arab survivors, but also any atrocity survivors, anyone who had um, uh, like an, an experience that we have to share it. We have to speak out loud, we have to write about it, we have to have, um, we have to publish it in scientific journals and everything. So I don't think that the whole world has the real picture, uh, the exact picture of what happened in Tigray. Overall Tigray, and also in Tigray's women, girls and children. I, I think they have failed. I mean, they're not trying, of course, uh, um, the blame is on them, but uh, I don't think they have the exact future. So they're not going to call it genocide or rape. And to call it genocide or rape, there are certain things that they have to follow. For me, I'm a professional who, who has been following 331 patients who survived different sorts of atrocities. That's quite enough for me to call it. If it if it's only can be described as genocidal, for me, that's quite enough. But for them, there are certain things that they have to does follow. Does the matter? I mean, does the number matter to call it a genocide or not? No. Even if it happened in one woman, even if it happened in one girl, even if it happened in one children, in one child, um, if it can only be described as genocidal in that girl or woman or a child, that's quite enough. I mean, I, I hate it when people get obsessed with numbers. Even with numbers, that's very disappointing. I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about hundreds of women. We're talking about thousands of women. I say from the, from the, the, the testimonies that I listen from, uh, the survivors I've been following, they say that the, the, the general analysis is that the grants has been raped anywhere, everywhere. There was no any protective factor for a Tigran woman, girl, and child at the moment when when the genocide or war was occurring during in Tigray in all, in those 18 months. There were no protective factor. I mean, women have been raped in church. They have been raped in religious institutions. That's one protective factor that we call in our culture, in our norm. It's a very protective factor. I mean. If you walk with an elder woman, if you walk with an elder man, no one will even see you in their full eyes. That's the norm that we grow up. A woman, who, I mean, a child who was walking with a woman was raped. She was snatched from the woman and she was raped. There was no protective factor for any Tigran woman, girls and child at the moment during the war, that means during the genocide or war. So if you ask me, I would say even the number would be disappointed. I mean, it would be shocking for the whole world, not only for us. Our estimator, I mean, uh, until now, all the researchers show that in Rwanda, the maximum is that 500,000 women, girls, and children. I think that the, 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 what happened in Tigray, even with number, it would be shocking. It would be more than that, if I have to anticipate. But that's not the main point. Even if there is a one, if I have 300, above 300 patients, even if it's one, even if one woman or a girl or a child was raped in such future, um, in such characteristics, that's quite enough to call it genocide or rape. We shouldn't be obsessed with numbers. We have to feel the pain of one woman, one child or one girl. That's quite enough. Right. So, I mean, uh, moving on. So what are the physical, like, for example, you, you've been telling me, so the number doesn't matter, regardless of one woman or many. Mm -hmm. So what happened on a woman that, I mean, the horrific acts really matter. Yes. So the inhumane things that you were mentioning earlier. Mm. Uh, so 
What are the physical and psychological trauma sustained when a survivor injures a genocide or rape? And how is it different from a peacetime or a wartime rape? Mm. I'm not mm. saying a peacetime or a wartime rape is uh, a positive thing. I mean, yes. we're, we're yeah. talking here, uh, we cannot choose from two evils. Both are evils. That's true. We have to re underline that. Yes. But what I'm saying is, what makes a genocide or rape different from those mm. types mm. of rapes? Yeah. What you said Tell us is, about that. yes, what you said is, uh, that's what I want also to, uh, to the all people who's listening here, uh, who's listening us, wants to, to understand in our conversation. We're not saying that peacetime or wartime rape is just a little or a genocide or is above that or anything. We're not comparing or contrasting all. Any sexual violence, any violence for that matter, not only sexual violence, any traumatic experience is horrific and no one should be experiencing that. What we are saying is what happened in Tigray is not only a peacetime rape, it's not only a wartime rape, it has a futures and characteristics of genocide or rape. That's what we are trying to imply, uh, but we're not comparing or contrasting anyone, uh, not one person should be doing that. A gender-based violence, uh, it's... It's something which has been perpetrated by any person in any uh, woman, girl, or child based on her gender, of course. And this gender-based violence, it could be rape or any other forms of sexual violence. It's a common crime perpetrated in any place in the whole world. It, it's still ongoing. I mean, uh, the world it, it didn't even uh, stop what happened in, in any woman, girl, or child in all over, uh, in all over the world. So when we say gender-based violence, it is rape and other forms of sexual violence that I would mention later, and it's a common crime. It's a common crime, I want to underline on that. And this gender-based violence, it targets a person solely because of her gender. So when we call it sexual violence, it's one form of gender-based violence, and the perpetrator targets uh, the, the woman or a child or the girl uh, solely because of her gender. So it hap of, of course, uh, sexual violence happens in males. When we when we talk about gender-based violence, it, it depends on on the the gender. That means it depends on the sex of the victim. It includes not only rape. It includes sexual uh, assault. Uh, it includes female genital uh, mutilation, which was very common in Ethiopia in our culture. We've been working on that for a couple of decades. It has changed, of course. It showed. Uh, um, a decrement, of course, but one form of gender-based violence is a female genital mutilation. mutilation yeah. Yes, domestic violence, forced marriage, and everything. This is gender-based violence. And when we specifically talk about a peacetime rape, a peacetime rape is, I mean, we, we differentiate mainly on the cause, the root. So the root cause of a peacetime rape, as, as I told you, it, it's, it's, it's solely depend on the gender of the, the, the victim or the survivor. Uh, but when we come to the wartime and genocide or rape, it's not solely depend on the, the gender or the sex or the, the, so it doesn't solely depend on the, the sex or gender of the perpetrator, I mean the victim. So when we talk about other than the peacetime rape, there is a wartime rape and a genocide or rape. So wartime rape and genocide or rape, they're different from peacetime rape. Peacetime rape, the root is the same. The cause is the power, uh, we have theories why sexual violence happened, why gender based happen. And one of the theories that, which is really influential, is that the power imbalance. So there is a power imbalance that we, we didn't still work on. So the, the male usually is entitled to, to refer a woman's body as, as a pleasure, um, a tool that the man finds pleasure only, solely. So because of this power imbalance, um, this, the peacetime rape happened because of that. When we come to the wartime rape and genocide or rape, it's the same. The, the root is the same. There is a power imbalance that, um, that led the man to be entitled to perform such a, a horrific uh, rape. It could be rape, it could be other sorts of other forms of that, I, that I'm going to share with you. All right. uh, so when it's wartime rape, it has another, the root is the same. But the intention is different. So, for example, in wartime rape, we have the United Nations definition. It says that a wartime rape is committed often intended to terrorize the population, break up families, and to destroy community, and in some instances, change the ethnic makeup of the next generation. 
it's deliberate, it's strategic in in wartime rape. Rape is a tool, a weapon, like like you know there are other military weapons, right? So rape, when it's wartime rape, it's a weapon, it's a tool that combatants use to to terrorize the population, to break up the family and destroy the community if it's possible. When we come to the genocide, and bring rape, them to submission, of course. Exactly, that's the main goal. Uh, when we come to genocide rape, it has a future. The cause is the same as the peacetime rape. It has a future of wartime rape. The intention is also the same with the wartime rape. When, when it's genocidal, it's not just a rape, it's ethnic rape. So when the perpetrators commit the genocidal rape, they are not only solely raping the woman based on their gender, they're not raping the woman, the girl, or the child, but they are raping the ethnic, the, the, the group in general. So what uh, the, the first feature that we call the genocidal rape and ethnic rape um, is it's, it's only based on, for example, in Tigray, they were raping Tigran as a, as a whole, as a group. When the perpetrator come, I'm not saying this from my, from my analysis or anything from my, uh, from my so own what thing. Are you, what are your basis for saying that now? Survivor's testimony. And based on the survivor's testimony, the perpetrators used to, used to share their intention. They used to share everything with them, what they think, what their above leaders, their commanders said, what they have yeah, been their told. Their superiors, right? Yes. Yeah. So they used to share that to the survivors while raping them because they, they, are not, they were not just, uh, they weren't sharing that because they were honest. They were sharing that, they were saying that because they want also to cause them a verbal abuse. We call it an ethnic-based verbal abuse. This ethnic-based verbal abuse is they want also not only uh, abusing her physically, but also they want to abuse her by verbally to cause her physical, I mean, it's psychological harm. torture. Exactly. So they say, you know, we have been told to do this so that we do this to you and to your group. My, my, my base is the survivor's testimony when I say it was an ethnic rape. They were saying that we're raping you not because you're beautiful, not because you're a girl, because we have girls, we have wives, not only one, but many. We have beautiful women in our country, but we're raping you because you're Tigrans and we want to humiliate Tigrans. We want to destroy you. We want to eradicate you. We want to purify your blood and any other intentions that they hold that they were told to do and everything. They were ordered. It was rape. One, um, one definition or feature of genocide Arab is it's not, order, it's not rape that occurred out of control. It's rape that so occurs is it, So in then order. let me stop you there. So is it, is it fair to say it was a systematic? Yes. It was a, is it possible to say it was a systematic thing that happened? Yes. On those survivors. Yes. And many more that haven't shared their stories. That's true. That's why I said in the first, this is just only my experience with 300 and above survivors. And when we hear, when the survey is conducted, we're going to hear a lot more. And for your question, yes. And you know why? The, the perpetrators that have been perpetrating the sexual violence, the genocide or rape to the Tigrayan women, child and girls, they used to say that they differentiated in two terms. The first term is that before they came, there were things that they were ordered. So they say that before they came, before we came, we have been told to do this, we have been told to do that. And they say, they share that what they have been commanded by their commanders, by their civil leaders and everyone. So they share that with the survivors, that's one thing. The other, the second thing that, uh, the second reason that we call it systematic is uh, before they came, of course, and after they came, they have been told to do, they have been instructed and commanded in order to do such, 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 such things. And they say that we have been commanded to do this to you. And some, uh, I mean not all, but only few of them, they say that we're only doing this because we have been ordered, we have been commanded. I, I don't want to do this to you, but if I don't do this, I'll be killed. It's an order. Yes. That's what makes it deliberate and systematic. Wow. Very sad. So, uh, so currently, based on your your sexual violence victims that you've been following through, currently you're on the way to publish uh, a story of sixty women. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, so the book is about to be published in different languages. So, what would you say was the message you want to share with the world 
And what do you think the world should know about what happened exactly on the ground on Tigrayan women and girls, innocent women and girls? What should the world know on the ground? Yeah. Tell me about this. Okay. Um, I've wrote two books in Amharic. The, the, the base are two books. And these two books are being translated into different languages. Um, the first book is only the, the narration of 60 survivors. In these narrations, I didn't, I didn't include any word from my own. I only included what they shared. And it's a narration based on their own story, their own their, their, their experience when they share it by their own words. And I want to first publish this book because I don't want to include any analysis that, I, that, that has been described in research or anything. So I want to share the world, I mean, the stories, the 16 stories as, as, a, as a, not only, I mean, not a sample that happened in Tigray, but to show the world when we begin, when we begin the discussion, I say that the reason that the world is failing to call the, 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 the sexual violence that happened in Tigray as genocidal, to describe it as genocidal, it's because they don't have the evidence for it. They don't have the experience. They don't have anything to call it genocidal. So I want to show the world it for happening. I mean, do you mean they, they were never here on the ground to find out the facts? As, as far as I know, is yes. That, is that what you mean? As far as I know, yes. I think um, not, not many journalists, nor not, not any uh, person with legal entity has been here in Tigray to, to study what happened in Tigray's women, girls and child. As, as far as I know, I don't think they have been here. Uh, and now they're asking that there is a UN a Human Rights Commission inquiry. That's they're asking to be correct. here. Yes. They're, they're asking to be here and to, to study or how to investigate what happened in Tigray in general and also uh, in Tigray's women, girls and child also. Uh, but they haven't been, um, they, they didn't get a permission to be in Tigray. So I don't think, that's why I say that I don't think they have the right picture. I don't think they have the right image. So what, what I want to do is to share the first book of the 60 survivors. These are the volunteer one. They say that um, they didn't assume at the time of the, the during the war, that means during the genocide or what, they say that we might not be alive to share our story. So take it and please share this, the world it. We might die, maybe, I don't know, tomorrow or after tomorrow. Um, so if, if you don't survive to share our story, please take that and share the world lead. And don't mention any name. It's anonymous, of course. They say that um, don't share any name or anything because I don't want my families to know that that have been happening in their mother, in their sister, or in their child. Don't share anything about me, but share it as it happened like to the Tigrayan women, girls, and child ensure that it happened in the group in general. So I took their word. It were, it, there were 60, six all. So I wrote it in a way that they, in the way they describe it in their own word. So I want the world to know this happened in Tigrayan women, like the survivor said. They only want to show this to the world that that happened. Uh, they want to say that this happened at this time in this generation, this happened to us, to the group in general. So I want the whole world to see in this book. We are also writing it in Germany. I think in, in one month, if, 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 if things work, you know, you know, in what kind of situation we are. We can, I mean, um, I cannot be sure, but what we are planning is there's a, a German scholars, they, they have translated into Germany. So we'll have an Amharic in, in Germany version here in the, in, in, in the Germany state. So I want the whole world to see in Amharic for Ethiopians, in English for the whole world, in Germany for the people who reads and speaks or writes in Germany. Uh, I want those to see what happened as the, as the survivors said, this happened, happened uh, in Tigray, in Tigray's women, girls and children. I want to show that to the whole world today. I want to have. I want them to have at least a, a little uh, picture. This is not the whole picture. This yeah. is just a spoonful of water from from you know the ocean. So I want to sh to sh to show the whole world, starting from Ethiopians, Africans, and the whole world, to see uh, by just uh, taking a spoonful of water from the ocean. It's a drop in the yes. ocean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, uh, we know you've been working on treating survivors of sexual violence in Tigray. What exactly have been you've been able 
uh, to do so far with your survivors, uh, victims of the sexual mm -hmm. violence. What do the survivors need to get their lives back on track? Okay. Um, I've been treating, as I told you, above 300 patients, survivors of different atrocities. And um, what I have been providing is mental health and psychosocial support. It's called MHPSS. So I've been providing a short-term, immediate uh, mental health and psychosocial support. I've been providing a long-term for about six months. We've been, we've been trying to continue that in the past one year, but it was very difficult to reach to the survivors since we have a problem with transportation or we have a problem with fuel and everything. But what I've been trying to provide is a mental health and psychosocial support for the women and girls and children who survive sexual violence, very horrific features, who has very horrific features. So I, I don't usually want to talk about what have been done to the survivors because it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't enough. I mean, um, the futures, um, the, 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 the characteristics when, when you see it, for example, the first characteristic is gun grip. And as I told you, I had a survivor who survived sexual violence not by one, not by two, but by 14 and 16 soldiers at one time. And to treat her, to provide her mental health and psychosocial support for days, for weeks, for months, it wasn't quite enough. Of course, I, I would not give her life back. Nothing will be the same. But we should be there to provide the mental health and at least psychosocial support to help her cope with it for years. It takes years to... to to, heal. to help her, yes, to, to recover, to rehabilitate from what happened. Some, they, they, they not only survive uh, I mean, sexual violence, they lost their womb. I mean, they, they cannot, um, they, 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 they lose the chance of having a child again. That's not easy. Being raped by many soldiers, that's one thing but also to, to, to also to suffer from the physical violence that, that have been perpetrated on you to damage your womb. And because of that, then you lose the chance of giving a birth again in your entire life. You the inability to give birth. Yes. So imagine, I mean, how can I say that I have provided mental health and psychosocial support to this woman when I know that it wasn't quite enough, it wasn't enough. I, I don't usually want to talk about the things that I provided, the, the, the skills and techniques, because it, it has to continue for years. It has to continue at least for months, and we, we couldn't. Yeah, and we a, are not still doing this. It's a relentless process that needs to yeah. be done exactly. for the healing to happen, right? Exactly. But if you ask me, I, I have tried my best to be there, to say that I'm here for you, you're not alone. And I, I was there with being not judgmental. So I hear all the stories. Sometimes I cried with them. Yeah. I, I hug them, which, we, which is not common in our profession. But you know what happened in Tigray? What happened in Tigray? It was, it was abnormal. It was abnormal. And anything that we do is a normal reaction for the abnormal event that happened to us. I've been there only saying that I'm here for you. I'm going to hear you. I'm going to listen to you share the stories with me, and I'm going to provide some skills, some evidence-based scientific skills and techniques. I've done that, but it wasn't enough. <laughs>